Thank you. Well, thanks, Adam and Candia, for having me today. Tonight, today, uh, it's a little bit earlier here in Winnipeg, but um, I'm excited to share with you all some lessons and tips I have discovered as a new data manager in a company where we had a long way to go in making our data um, and insights valuable. So I'll start off with an introduction about myself. Uh, I started in data analytics from a statistical background and really quickly fell in love with solving complex problems and making insights actionable. Uh, I joined Bold Commerce over two years ago uh, and started as a senior data analyst and within the two years have grown into a manager role where I now support data engineers, BI developers, and data analysts. So some personal fun facts about me, um, as you can see here on this slide, uh, I don't take a lot of pictures about myself, which is something I discovered putting this presentation together. Uh, so that's why you get to enjoy this funny video I took, uh, or I didn't take, my partner took of me a few weeks ago. Uh, I love being outside, as you can see, and I have two really large dogs, um, as you can see in the video, and there is about a 90% chance that they'll start barking at some point during this presentation. So I apologize if uh, you can hear them in the background. Uh, so let's dive into the presentation topic. So I wanted to touch on five areas that I have found uh, to make data more approachable and valuable at the company. So the first area I wanted to touch on is adopting the right tools. So this is going to be focused around ensuring your team is making the most of their time. Second, let's standardize some processes. The goal here isn't to adopt like rigorous processes or uh, rigorous guidelines, but more to just kind of set those expectations for your team as well as the company around data. Uh, third, documentation. So this is a really critical piece in making the most out of data and it's really often overlooked. So we'll dive into a couple ways that my team has really made uh, impact with documentation. Fourth, uh, sharing and getting feedback. So data cannot be siloed into an individual team. So I'll share some ways that, you know, we've gotten others involved in improving the data insights at the company. And last, finding a home. Uh, so this might be a bit of an odd tip in data approachability and value, but I'll explain more when I get there. So. Let's start with adopting the right tools. So this is a pretty common step to making data more approachable and valuable, uh, but it's important to kind of go through why it's, uh, it's so valuable. So the tools the data team implements and adopts need to be aligned first and foremost with company objectives. So uh, at Bold here, we're focused on finding tools that achieve three objectives. One, we can enable anyone at the company to access data they need for their role. So the tools really needed to cover technical and tech, non-technical roles of really all aspects. Second, we needed to remove a bunch of data, data silos that were currently in place. So we had many teams operating within their own individual product or application, and we lacked the ability to look across those products or into even other systems. Third goal was to start building a platform or an environment where we can eventually enable our customers access to their own data. So in addition to aligning our goals with the company objectives, we wanted to make, sorry, we wanted to make uh, sure that they fit with the, the current skills and experience within the team. So we didn't want to adopt uh, new tools that we had to completely learn from scratch from, with everybody. There was too much time that we would need to invest in that. It's important to also keep in mind of your current team size. So when you're, if you only have one data engineer or one data analyst, it's probably not a great idea to adopt a tool where it completely relies on the maintenance of that data engineer or that analyst to kind of keep it up and functioning. What happens when they go on vacation? What happens if they're sick for an extended period of time? We're obviously in a new world right now where that can happen. Um, so the tools that you pick should also not take up your whole team's time and maintenance. So we've all been there and it's not a lot of fun when all you're doing week in day, like day in, day out is ma maintaining your tools. Uh, and the last tip in picking tools is your, is long-term scalability. So you're, 
your tools you decide on should allow your team uh, to add new features or new capability as you scale with the company. So I wanted to dive into how we chose to kind of set up our data architecture and some of our tools for the data team to, to work with. Um, so here's a very, very basic overview of a typical cloud-based data architecture setup uh, of data sources. They go into our data lake, uh, from there into a data warehouse, and then lastly into some kind of BI or visualization tool. So there were many considerations and many options uh, for the data lake and the data warehouse steps. So as a team, we all decided to put together many presentations and arguments uh, and reasons for internal discussions uh, of which tool we wanted to adopt and, um, and move forward with. So after everybody did their presentations, we all had the discussion and we ended up landing on having separate BigQuery projects within our data lake and then into our data warehouse. So why did we choose this? One, at the time when we made this decision, we had two data engineers with little plans to expand uh, additional or open additional roles. Uh, as a company, we're already invested in Google. We're already using BigQuery for other data projects. Uh, and both of our data engineers had no or very limited experience using other uh, data lake tools, such as uh, Delta Lake or Redshift or any of the other uh, options. Uh, where we made a lot of sacrifices is with the long-term scalability of this. So we recognize that there are other options for this, for uh, the data lake and the data warehouse. Uh, and we're missing quite a few pieces of this. We're missing a staging warehouse. We're missing the ability to uh, bring in um, uh, data redaction policies. We're missing a lot of those additional pieces right now. But we wanted to get these core foundational uh, pieces set up before we move on to additional functionality. So with this, the next decision was figuring out what our BI tool is going to be. Uh, I mean, you could probably see a theme going on with Google right now, but we actually did go through and implement and test uh, two or three different BI tools before we we chose one. Uh, a few, the reasons that came down to, or the reason the, the decision factors was one, it had to be, it had to integrate with Google BigQuery very easily. We did not have the time or the capacity to, to make anything uh, custom. Uh, two, security approval. Uh, one of the tools was an outright no by our security team. So that is also a key factor when you're bringing in a new tool is making sure that your security team is happy with it. And lastly, ensuring that it will meet our business objectives of one, enabling those non-technical users and two, to integrate with our apps in the future. So with no surprise, we landed on Looker, <laughs> which is a Google tool now. Uh, so the next decision we had was figuring out how we were going to get data from the sources into the data lake project. Uh, and we wanted to be able to do this efficiently and considering our limited resources with data engineers. Uh, we needed to move data fast and did not have the capacity to build custom one-off connections for, for different tooling or data sources. So um, we ended up going with a tool called Stitch. So Stitch is a, a tool solely for the purpose of extracting and loading data. It doesn't perform any tra transformation. So we brought this tool on uh, for a few reasons. One, as I mentioned, our team size. Uh, two, the maintenance on it is much lower than having custom connections or custom pipelines. So we have one tool to maintain across the team now. And lastly, the flexibility that Stitch provides with being able to, to schedule our loads into the data lake to meet our data users at their frequency they need. So the last decision with our data architecture and enabling our data team was to land on a transformation tool. So specifically, we wanted to be able to uh, make transformations between the lake and the warehouse and then between the two warehouses. So we landed on a tool called DBT or data build tool. And again, for many of this, the same reasons, uh, this tool uses SQL, which is a common language across our team, across the company, across many different analytics uh, roles. 
Uh, it also integrated really well with BigQuery and Looker. So uh, we know that this picture is not complete, as I've already mentioned, but we really wanted to get this architecture in place before continuing to expand on it. So we can add in additional pieces like a staging data warehouse or uh, Google's data loss prevention when we need data encryption or a sandbox testing environment in Looker when we're ready. But as I continuously remind myself and the team, work in progress items provide no value to you or to the company. So we're focused on getting these key foundational pieces set up and providing value to the company before adding in more functionality. Okay, so my next key or like this next section for making data more approachable and valuable is on standardizing processes and setting expectations for the data team and company. So the first tip I have here for setting processes is to first understand what other processes the de other departments of the company has are doing to and are doing to leverage them as much as possible. So this will increase your likelihood of uptake and understanding of the processes. So first one we adopted is decision design documents. Uh, so what is a decision design document? Uh, it's a foundational piece where you can clearly articulate the problem and different solutions for uh, a, ch a challenge you have on the team or maybe a roadblock or a, uh, a dis that really that, um, that decision point where you can go either way. So the most important piece of this document is that it's in a centralized place where the entire company can access it. So therefore, uh, we all use Confluence at the company. So we have a standardized Confluence template set up. You open it up, it has all the fields in it, and you start filling it out. They're pretty straightforward with objective, your proposed options or solutions with pros and cons, uh, data consideration, operations considerations, uh, performance constraints, et cetera, and then finally an implementation plan and next steps. So by adopting these decision documents, we now have a trail of why certain decisions were made on our data team, and we can get input from outside of just our little team. The next with standardizing processes is around licenses and tools um, and setting those standard permissions. So again, we didn't go and reinvent the wheel. We worked within our IT and our SRE teams uh, with our current processes to set up standard permission groups that would suit the majority of the users at the company. So this included setting up four primary per permission groups across uh, BigQuery, DBT, and Looker. So those key tools that we, we have onboarded onto the team. So now that they're set up, we've actually removed a major barrier for individuals to access the systems and anyone can just submit an IT ticket and get added to that group. So transparency is one of the key features here. We've documented all of the permission levels in each of the systems in Confluence, where again, the entire company can review it. Uh, this, is in, this is critical in allowing individuals to understand how to request access and what they will get when they do. Um, yeah, so then the fourth one I have here is setting expectations around data requests. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times <laughs> Uh, our week as a team got derailed for urgent requests that come up that ended up just being somebody's curiosity question. Um, so as with all of our other processes, we just have a very simple confluence document outlines uh, how to submit a request, which is just through a JIRA ticket. And then we ask multiple follow-up questions. We want to make sure that their request is aligning with the company goals. If the individual has a Looker license, we teach them how to fulfill the data request themselves versus us doing it for them. Uh, if they don't have a Looker license currently and the request does align with our goals, then we'll inform them of which sprint or which week we will work on that request. Uh, we don't bring in requests automatically or in that same week, as again, we're such a small team that it would just derail our whole progress towards our, our large initiatives. Third way to improve data approachability and value is in documentation. So first tip, which I feel a lot of people cringing right now, is to document tables and fields. Uh, so the data team plays a critical role in reducing these data silos across uh, and increasing access. So we found a key component of this is um, 
documenting tables and fields. So the team documents a table and field at this DBT level in between the lake and the warehouse. Uh, we do this here so that all of the steps that follow inherent these descriptions uh, and carry them forward. So we have those descriptions now built into our DBT models, into our warehouses, as well as automatically into Looker. I'm not going to lie. This was a... <laughs> incredibly challenging step when we first started but now that we've shown teams the value of having these having these descriptions it's becoming a much easier sell to continue them and um, we continue them by whenever somebody asks for a new table in the warehouse uh, they do have to provide us with those descriptions along with that request so it becomes a lot more manageable for us to to maintain so this second tip with documentation uh, is standardizing tech uh, terminology. So we, when we develop a new term on our team, say GMB or churn, uh, the team then puts together a confluence definition page that compiles all of the information related to it in one source. So this confluence template I'm showing here, I know it's probably pretty small, uh, outlines kind of that information that we fill in. So on this page, we include a business level definition. We link Looker dashboards directly there. We include technical definition. We include data warehouse table names and locations, uh, possibly a very basic example query is to use in the data warehouse to kind of get people started. Uh, we link in DBT models uh, to show that foundational logic to get to that metric. Uh, Looker explores for people to kind of build their own off of it. And any additional documentation, which may include design decision, design decision documents, uh, which I talked about earlier of maybe how we got to some of those decisions on that definition. Uh, we link this page in more places than we probably should, and people are probably annoyed with it at this point. Uh, but we link them in Looker dashboards, we link them in Slack. Whenever anybody asks a question of like, what does churn mean? We link the Confluence page, uh, trying to get everybody to use one single term at the company for one, de one definition for one term. There we go. Uh, so the fourth way I have here to increase data approachability and value is pretty obvious, but uh, share often and encourage and normalize feedback. So the first way is to present often. My team has been consistently presenting to the company about once a month, and we've absolutely noticed a difference in the projects that are being proposed to us, the departments that are being more engaged, and more people actually accessing the data directly, either through the data warehouse or Looker. Second tip here is to include stakeholders early and frequently. So there's nothing worse than getting to an end of a project and realizing that the stakeholder uh, was expecting something completely different or they just don't even care. So for us at Bold, we work a lot with internal stakeholders. So we figure if they can't or aren't willing to spend 15 to 30 minutes a week or every two weeks providing us feedback on progress or answering our questions, then we're likely not working on the most important question uh, for them at the time. We then take that uh, and adjust to a different stakeholder, to a different project, or maybe just tweak the project to make sure we're, we're aligned. Third tip is data clinics. So this is probably one of the highest value return items I'll talk about today in terms of making data more approachable and valuable. So what are data clinics? Um, data clinics basically open office hours for data related questions. They're, we hold them internally twice a week, each just for one hour. Uh, they're the same time every week, same Google link, same everything, uh, and we call it kind of a safe place for anybody to jump on a call, ask any dumb data question, that's usually not a dumb question, actually never a dumb question, um, to a data team member that's kind of sitting there waiting to answer your questions. So the goal of this is to really support anybody with those questions to enhance and to uh, enable them within our environments. Uh, the last tip here is to just not be afraid to provide the stakeholder with feedback. So uh, we have started providing our internal stakeholders with feedback on ways to improve the data that they're collecting or the questions that we can't answer with current data or items that our teams could align better on. 
and I just realized that my thing didn't come up, sorry. <laughs> okay, my last and final uh, piece for making data approachable and valuable is a little bit different, but um, it's quite important. So your data team, whether that is engineering or analytics or ML, kind of whatever you classify as data at your company, uh, you need to find it its correct home and place within the company. There isn't one answer that fits all, but I would encourage you just to look at where your team or teams are and if they're getting the appropriate support and opportunity to be valuable. So within two years at Bold, I think I have landed in four plus teams and I can't tell you how different they are in giving me and the team opportunity to be valuable. Uh, so first I have, or I guess second I have here is establishing a team structure. So that's gonna serve uh, your current stakeholders and grow into future needs. Should your data team have a centralized or decentralized model? Uh, is there value in having the data engineers next to the data analysts? Uh, these are all questions that are gonna be, or answers that are gonna be different depending on your organization setup and the organizational needs. Um, at Bold, I have kind of landed right now on our current needs as a combination where we have a centralized team, we're unified on tools and processes, but each team member is individually focused on supporting a different department or two. Uh, so this has allowed us to really support each other, but also to really dive into a single department and get to know their data and provide them the most value and insights as possible. Next here I've, I have is establishing career matrices for each role in the data team. I know it's kind of odd, but I found this to be a really critical step in making data approachable and valuable as it immediately encouraged the team, after I released them, it immediately encouraged the team to start taking the time to learn new methods or technologies. It gave them targets around working with stakeholders. It gave them, or it explained to them how their role fit with other roles of the company. It really elevated them to the next level. And then the last item I have here is to appreciate each team member for their uniqueness and perspective they bring to the team. So everyone has their own strengths, uh, and uh, they align different with those strengths with different needs of the company to drive higher value. So for example, I have one data analyst who is actually a traditionally trained software developer, um, and they are amazing at taking much more complex data structures and data tables that um, I, I personally would be able to work with. Um, but then I have another data analyst who is amazing at telling stories from complex insights. and so. She, they're teamed up with a different team who has different goals and objectives with their with their individual data. So making best use and making those uh, connections with teams is uh, very important. So that's all I have. I hope the presentation has given you some takeaways uh, that you can use at your organization. Uh, I really wanted to su suggest some different ideas that we implemented at Bold and really found tied back to getting more out of our data. Um, what I have learned is not everything related to data uh, more valuable, but related to displaying a new metric or developing a new model. But it really revolves around communication, documentation, empowering your data team with the right tools, processes, and their home. And that's all I have. Um, we did have one question in the chat section, which uh, I think you kind of, kind of were talking, you touched very, very briefly on it, but it's kind of about that, that data science, uh, sorry, the data analyst uh, type function. Maybe if you have some advice uh, for Ezra, who has asked, uh, how does he transition for, from a data analyst to, to a data scientist role? Any advice or thoughts you have there? Oh, um, you kind of hit the other topic I was debating mm. uh, for this presentation, which is why data analysts are, I wasn't sure what the right word is here, but cooler than data scientists. Um, Scandalous, and more powerful. Kristen. Scandalous. It's a little, I wasn't bold enough to to put a presentation together on it. Maybe next time, but I I don't know at this point in the company or the team that I run, um, I would actually hire data scientists. Um, the reason for that, and we can talk about this offline in more detail, but the reason for that is data scientists typically have two different roles or tasks associated to them, more of like the data analyst of 
uh, understanding those basic, not basic, but those insights or running some statistical modeling. Uh, and then there's the machine learning side of it where you're running those machine learning models, you're doing more complex analyses or different, uh, uh, diff basically different approach. Data scientists kind of straddles those two roles. I haven't come across a data scientist who is equally or, you know, even 60, 40 split between those two roles. And I hope I'm proven wrong in the future. I, I mean, I'm young in my career, but I would say I would hire a data analyst to focus on those analytical questions. And then I would hire a machine learning developer or uh, an AI developer when you get to those actual machine learning questions and needs. They're two very different approaches. They're two very different questions. And putting that in one person just really confuses me, to be honest. I'm sorry, that doesn't really answer your question, but. I've got a couple of other questions. We have a question here from Sammy. I have not proofread these, so they're, they're coming at you hard and fast. Uh, Sammy has asked, uh, along the along those lines, I have an engineering degree and a computer science degree with two boot camps in data analytics, and I have been trying to break into data analytics for the last couple of years. So do you have any advice for me? Advice okay. for Sammy there, Christine. Okay. Um, maybe not perfect advice, but how we transitioned uh, our individual. So I'll backtrack here. Uh, the data analyst I have on my team that is traditionally trained as a software developer, uh, he actually started at Bold as a software developer, worked at Bold for a couple of years, and then we opened up this analyst position and he reached out to me and was like, any chance you would consider me? And I'm like, was not expecting any internal candidates to be qualified or have you know, the skills or anything. Started talking to him. I actually put him through the interview process. He did really well. And we what we ended up doing was setting him up on a mentorship with me. So he did a mentorship for about two or three months just to ensure that one, he knew what he was getting into with what an analyst role really is. Uh, and two, making sure that he had, you know, that that drive to answer questions, that drive to really dive into data and not necessarily the coding or the programming behind it so that's how uh that individual came to me which was really unexpected and i would say if you don't have that opportunity to mentor with with somebody within your company there's always ways to uh jump onto competitions online like there's a bunch of kegel competitions or um different ideas like that where you could join a team or join some other analysts or data scientists or ML uh, developers or engineers um, and join them in on a competition, get some experience that way to show that you do have that ability to not just program, but answer and find insights and questions. Yeah, we, we've seen the demand. I think as soon as there's a new industry, data science, let's take for example, about four or five years ago, there was just this explosion of demand and a lot of people naturally so wanting to kind of ride that wave and i think there's been this huge influx of juniors and companies like we cloud data that amanda did where they're kind of like little boot camp kind of things um what we've seen python ladies and gentlemen yeah. is the core skill that's crossing all these kind of different data functions data engineer you need python data scientists you need python data analyst question mark maybe not so heavy on the dev stuff machine learning python robotics python it's it's probably if you want to move more away from development and get into kind of algorithms and models python is i would say essential uh, and if you have four plus years python dev experience you're going to be making a, a lot of money so uh yeah hopefully that answers your question there uh sammy and uh okay this is a fun question, Stephanie. Um, I wonder if you're Stephanie Levi, uh, a friend of mine. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, Stephanie has asked, uh, if you had to describe a data analyst's personality with an animal, what would you choose? Oh, with an animal. It's a random one for you there, Christine. It's okay. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, one of my team members asked me in our one-on-ones what color my 
mood was that day. And so, I, I mean, we get these questions a lot. Um, animal. Now I can't get anything but a snake out of my head from the python. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, something... Maybe like an okay. owl. I can see like an owl data analyst kind of with like the, the big glasses and like just very, very serious, very analytical. Yeah, I was kind of trying to think something outside of the box of, of owl, but I'm not coming up with much. Maybe a penguin just because that's here um, of... I have nothing, no reason for that. Um, it's what, that it's like that. a spirit animal. It, does, it doesn't have to have any rhyme or reason. It's just your feelsies. Uh, cool. All right. Last question for you there, Christine. Again, haven't proofread these, so they're just coming at you. Um, so many people have told me that SQL is the key to success in data analytics. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, I think about that as a couple of points. Um one, my SQL or SQL, whatever you want to call it, skills are not good compared to my team. My team can out query me all day in, day out. And I am so thankful that they're my team because that's why they're here. But um, so I went through many years of being a data analyst with writing very, very basic SQL queries of select star from this export call the day. Um, and then doing all of my stuff in R or Python. And that's how I ran, you know, being a data analyst for many years. Now, at Bold, for instance, I actually with those career matrices, and, and this kind of highlights that importance of it, we have a couple different tracks for data analysts. You can be that research data analyst is what I've called it of, you know, answering those Python, like writing Python and R scripts where you're you're writing those logistic regression or the linear or clustering or whatever kind of models you want to run. There's also the analyst who is more focused on descriptives and maybe building those really complex visual visualizations and looker. Uh, so they're kind of that um, uh, visualization analyst. They would need absolutely SQL and they would need to be really good at it. So I would say, just like we were discussing with data scientists, what is that? <laughs> Um, I think that kind of holds with data analysts too. There's, you know, three, four different paths and roles in a data analyst. And I think it depends on what kind of data analyst you want to be.